Welcome to Elric's Horizon series. This is a sixth webinar in our series uh, focused on big things that are affecting the Ontario livestock sector. One of the topics that's of real importance is how you drive change. We hear a lot about innovation. Innovation is all about change. Change is all about people. So how do you motivate people to make changes on their farm businesses based on research results? That gets called a lot of things. We've chosen to call it getting research into practice or GRIP. Uh, a reminder for those who are new to this series that if you have questions during the webinar, please use the uh, Q&A function and they will be saved and brought forward later in the question and answer series. Today, we welcome Steve Roche, who's our uh, speaker for uh, this topic area. Steve has a PhD in epidemiology from the University of Guelph. He's the owner and principal consultant with Acer Consulting, who uh, on their website talk about improving animal health through applied research and creative communications. Um, I personally think Steve is one of the leaders in this field, and I'm really pleased that he could join us as he has been a partner with Elric on a number of initiatives. And I think um, if he's willing, I see him being a partner with Elric uh, to a large extent going forward into the future. So Elric's expert on GRIP is Steve Roche. Over to you. Welcome. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, first and foremost, to, to Elric for having me uh, speak today. It's a, a topic that's sort of near and dear to my heart um, and, and from a variety of angles and a variety of perspectives. And, and so I'll hopefully touch a, a little bit on that here um, through my, my 20 minute talk or so. So just bear with me one moment and I will share my screen here. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about challenges, strategies, and opportunities from the perspective of getting research into practice. And we don't have enough time to really get into the nuts and bolts or details. So I want to try and provide a few ideas on where have we come, where are we today, and, and where might we be able to go, or what, some, what are some of the needs and outcomes we want to strive to achieve. Uh, if you've seen me talk before or know me, I, I really like to tell stories. I really like to talk about my experiences through uh, sort of a narrative. And so I want to introduce the topic of getting research into practice in the context of my own research uh, as a PhD student, where my goal was to really keep poop out of calves' mouths. Um, my, my job here uh, coming into the Ontario dairy industry in particular was to try and influence on-farm change specifically around the prevention and control of a disease called Yoni's disease. This is a chronic infectious disease of dairy cattle and other ruminants worldwide. And it's an issue that uh, over the years had been uh, creeping up and there was more and more emphasis in the Ontario dairy industry and actually across North America for that matter programs were being developed and delivered, uh, trying to motivate farmers to do something. There were financial incentives, there were consulting and, and educational opportunities, and yet evaluations prior to my involvement showed that even in the face of specific recommendations provided to uh, producers to make changes, we were not seeing a lot of on-farm adoption. We were not seeing a lot of on-farm change. And there's really good reason to focus on this disease. We see it affecting the health and welfare of dairy cattle, but perhaps more importantly, we also see that it can be uh, potentially linked to diseases like Crohn's disease or even diabetes in, uh, in humans. And so the zoonotic potential here makes it something that's potentially concerning. So we're not seeing a lot of change. And my PhD was all about, well, how do we stimulate that change? And over the course of a number of years and a number of different projects, I think I started to uncover some of the pieces. And I'll try and share some of those things as we go. But the key lesson that I want to kind of leave you with here is the fact that even when we have the right knowledge, the right tools, or we think we have the right tools, getting research into practice is far from simple. It's very complex. And I think most of you here will appreciate that. As Mike said, my role is sort of uh, twofold. I'm a researcher and, and own and operate Acer Consulting based in, in Guelph. And I also am adjunct faculty at the Ontario Veterinary College. And I'm really interested in the idea of extension or getting research into practice. And most importantly, I'm interested in what makes people tick. How do we define our end users? How do we understand them? And using that understanding of their mindset, their attitudes, their preferences, how do we develop and deliver more effective programs, more effective information at the end of the day? So really briefly on what I do, I'm all about trying to understand and improve animal health and welfare. 
I am specifically and very, uh, very practically focused on how to design programs and tools that translate science into clear messages. And I'm also really interested in trying to help others do the same thing. So I deliver a lot of training programs and try to build knowledge and influ influence attitudes and ultimately motivate change. So these are sort of the three pillars of, of what my business is all about and really who I am, I suppose, when it comes to the characteristics and my perspective that I bring to getting research into practice. So how do we get a grip, uh, if for lack of a better word? One of the first things that I like to talk about is terminology. Mike and I have chatted many times about the evolution of the idea of getting research into practice. More traditionally, we talk about extension, right? And, and now it's depending on who you are, we'll talk more about KTT or knowledge translation and transfer or knowledge mobilization is a, a term that's sort of uh, gained popularity. But the reality is, is that depending on the sector, depending on the region and depending on when we got involved, there are a variety of different terms that generally talk about the same thing. How do we get information from one group to another to influence change, ideally for the better or the betterment of animal welfare, human health, whatever the outcome might be? So where have we come from? Well, before the 1990s, we saw significant government investment in, in extension. And this is not unique to Ontario. This was really widespread. We saw this generally in agriculture, significant government and public dollars being put at play to do things like tech transfer and generally provide generalist services. And what I mean by that is we had extensionists in rural and regional spaces that could provide advisory services on, on a broad range of topics for producers. Now we move into the 1990s and moving forward, we saw the government really choose to explicitly pull back funding and focus more on user pay and privatization models. They really sat back and said, hey, we have a ton of money going into this and there are other third party or private advisors out there that, uh, that perform some of these services and we could redirect our funds and our efforts to educate those individuals and, ha and be an intermedi uh, have them act as an intermediary. This is where specialist services really become more prevalent. We see veterinarians taking on more consultancy and advisory roles, for example. And so we see a shift in model here directly as a result of, I think, a number of pressure points. Some of those pressure points that resulted in the government making these decisions included a changing rural sector. We see a smaller number of farms, but they are getting larger. We definitely saw a lack of uh, extension generally being able to provide a, a, an explicit uh, number in terms of return on investment. So the government sees a substantial dollar amount for the investment associated with extension, but what are we getting at the end of the day? What kind of outcomes? We certainly see, and I've talked a little bit about already, the changing role and definition of extension. And we see an evolving academic system. Most importantly, we see an, an academic system that still really doesn't incentivize or reward extension traditionally, or even getting research into practice. And I'll talk about that in a moment. We see, again, a growing and diverse advisor space, many different advisors starting to take up the role of providing, providing more advisory services. And we see a variety of different needs depending on which commodity, which sector we're talking about. And of course, with the advent of the internet, social media, and many other tools, we see a growing base of mediums that we can use to communicate and disseminate our knowledge. So if we look closely at some of the major actors, we can see from a government perspective, their role today is really primarily in terms of funding and some program administration. They do have some staff that provide generalist advisory services, and I usually call them more brokers. They uh, are able to put people in touch with the right information. They certainly have a heavy reliance on academia and advisors, and they do some, some capacity building in terms of programs and events. But ultimately, the government's role is primarily to try to fund or stimulate further uh, engagement in getting research into practice. When we look at academia, we see, of course, that these researchers have specialist technical knowledge. However, there's inconsistent connection and accountability with the end user, especially when it comes to the producer or the farmer. There is varied capacity building. And what I mean by that is we have certain groups that are spending more time actually on training and education with respect to how we get research into practice. But we have many other groups that it's really not in their bailiwick to worry about how to get research into practice on farms, for example. And as I mentioned, there's really no formal reward structure or incentivizing system or approach to ensure that this happens. 
Now, of course, we have a vibrant nonprofit sector. These are really strong amplifiers of research. However, they can be program or topic specific, right? Now we have stronger direct connection with these ind individual groups and accountability with end users. They are much more engaged with these groups, but they tend to lack funding and resources. And so there's limited in terms of how much they're actually able to do. When we look at farmer organizations themselves, again, they are big amplifiers of research and they're funders, of course, they're trying to leverage government dollars to stimulate more, uh, a better return on investment and higher penetration of information. However, we see highly varied levels of organization and support. This changes depending on whether you're a supply managed commodity like chicken or uh, dairy, for example, or whether you're a major or minor species. So if we're talking about small ruminants, for example, we see a smaller number and, and a, a, a smaller number of farms and certainly a little bit um, or fewer resources to put into this as well. So they have a heavy reliance on research and private advisory networks. So who are our private advisors? Well, again, it depends a little bit on region. It depends uh, even more so on commodity, but we see specialized in various technical service offerings being provided by groups like veterinarians, nutritionists, agronomists, geneticists, uh, genetics companies rather, or hoof trimmers, just to name a few. However, while they're directly accountable to end users, we see varied engagement in research and there's significant regional differences. I have a project right now that's looking at veterinary capacity in underserved areas of Ontario, of which there are many. And the challenges here is of course, those, those farmers that are living in these areas don't have the same access to resources or information from their veterinarian the way someone might do in Southwestern, might have in Southwestern Ontario. So there is a significant difference. The other limitation I see here is that if the government is really focusing on trying to educate those that ultimately work closely with producers, there is a big reliance on those advisors to have the right information seeking behavior, to get the information from the, the, the government in the first place, or to access the information, and then of course to deliver it consistently across the province. So one of the universal challenges to getting research into practice that I like to talk about is our primary effort has been on something like this, transferring and exchanging information or research results from one institution, organization, or individual to another with the goal of facilitating its uptake and adoption for improvement. This is my sort of my own definition of what KTT or knowledge mobilization extension or getting research into practice is all about. But one of the core assumptions that we tend to rely on is this mobilization or this transfer of knowledge or information. So I like to ask the question a bit facetiously, is a lack of knowledge really the limiting factor to getting research into practice? Well, the, the reality is, is it depends. Knowledge and awareness can certainly be powerful and in particular for things like technological innovations. Most people will talk about the uh, early adopters or the innovators and the laggards or that bottom 15%. This comes from a book called, and a term, or a, an approach called the diffusion of innovations, describing how a population will actually take up or adopt a given technological innovation. We see that knowledge of specific types of technologies or specific uh, enhancements or innovations can follow this curve quite nicely. We saw this in agriculture in the 20th century with the advent of precision or variable rate spraying, even the basic tractor or combine, and some things still do today. Think of internet, think of social media. We see this curve uh, quite readily adopted among uh, our populations. But we also know from a substantial amount of research that change on the farm is much more than just knowledge. And the challenge here is that we assume that education and awareness are lacking, even if it's not conscious assumptions, we make the subconscious assumption that this is a challenge. And we assume that once they have that information, they're going to take it and apply it rationally. So I provide them a, a, a producer with an update from a, a latest research study, and I assume that they're going to think about that and they're going to take that and apply it back home. There's nothing wrong with assuming that it will be, uh, that rational decisions will be made, except for the fact that we know that our, in our behavior collectively as humans is influenced by much more than knowledge. Some people are ignorant to change. Some people simply don't want to um, or see multiple different reasons for making a change. There are a whole host of reasons people engage or do not engage in specific types of behavior. Change ultimately is about mindset. It's about attitudes. It's about experiences and it's about beliefs. It's about priorities. 
mindset is what influences what we do and how we do it. And it is informed by a broad range of factors, one of which is knowledge. And so we need to understand our end user's mindset if we are to influence them more effectively. So what are some of our key considerations? Again, I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm not going to go into these in detail, but a couple of ones that I want to mention is the importance of understanding our audience, the power and the, the benefit of telling a story to, pa uh, to package our message up, and the value of tailoring our message, or our approach rather. So one of the big things that I always come back to, no matter who I'm consulting with, is who is your audience? Is it farmer, academia, farm organization, all of the above? The question is, or, or the reality is, it's generally easy to identify who we want to talk to, although sometimes that is a limitation. It's not well thought out. But more importantly, what are their characteristics? What are their barriers to adoption, for example? Here are a number of barriers that we know specifically from research pertain to specific topics, such as nutrient, uh, the willingness to adopt nutrient management plans, to engage in biosecurity, or to, uh, to improve animal welfare outcomes on farm above and beyond what a quality assurance scheme might expect. There are resistance to change barriers. There are lack of champions. There's a failure to accept the need for change in the first place. And yes, at the bottom, we see a lack of capacity or a lack of knowledge. There are a whole host of reasons people do not engage in, in the behavior we're after. And if we try to paint everyone with one brush, we're generally going to be less effective than we would otherwise engagement that's informed by their characteristics. There are many other characteristics of our audience we need to know. Again, I just don't have too much time to provide some of those, but basic demographic. Tell me, if you haven't read this book called Made to Stick, I really recommend it. It talks about the value of telling and delivering effective stories. And the reason stories are so effective is because it provides context and practical application. It offers insights, direct insights about how people should behave, attitudes and experiences, and it packages advice and recommendations in, a, in an engaging way. Simply put, stories are more effective and our brains are wired to grab onto stories. So it can be a more effective way of delivering information. Now, if you go to the next slide, and the next couple of slides really are speaking to the importance of tailoring our approach. There are so many different approaches available to us now. One size certainly doesn't fit all, fit all. And nowadays, in order to capture a wide range of preferences, we need to make use of a variety of them, from things like fact sheets and basic print uh, and in person when COVID-19 isn't an issue, to more uh, creative approaches such as infographics, podcasts, or online toolkits. So if you jump to the next slide, you'll see some examples of some of the types of creative media that I've created. These are examples, just screenshots from a variety of different whiteboard illustrated animated videos that I create. If you jump forward to the, the next slide, you'll also see some examples of other types of tools that I've created from basic magazine articles to uh, interactive infographics online to um, other types of web-based resources. And if you jump to the next slide, you'll see an example of, uh, of a video that I've created where we take uh, big data, we take um, huge volumes of data and animate it on screen, and then I essentially narrate the, the data as it uh, unfolds in front of you. So if you jump to the next slide, I'll just end with a, a brief comment on what's next. So there's three key things I think we need to think about. We need to continue to work on developing programs, evaluating policies and revising new or developing new ones and revising best practices to achieve three outcomes. One is to improve and enhance our capacity to, to grip, to get research into practice. That includes in, increased capacity in training, more scholarship on how we do this, and of course, more investment to enable us to do this. We need better collaborate, collaboration with our groups uh, that I mentioned earlier, from industry to academia to research and so uh, research to uh, government and nonprofit sectors. One of the most important things I think we need to uh, embrace more is including farmers and farm organizations from the get-go. First thing up front, how do they want to be involved? What are their challenges and how can we have more impact with our research? And of ultimately having more coordination would be more effective as well. A center or a structure that helps to guide activities, specific broker or brokering specific approaches and motivating change at the end of the day 
I would really love to see a group or an organization that was there to provide more advisory services to all of those other actors that I mentioned that are interested in trying to be more effective at getting research into practice. Um, uh, so with that, I, I think I'll end things there. I apologize for the, uh, the technology. Um, hopefully you were able to at least follow along a little bit there and happy to answer any questions as we go. Thanks, Steve. Really appreciate your uh, presentation and we've got a few questions in the chat for you. And uh, I'll start off with, uh, oh, just one that's kind of loaded, that uh, how do you measure the impact of KTT or getting research into practice? Yeah, it's um, it's sort of the the uh, I guess the question that we're that we're always grappling with a little bit um, for those of us working in, in trying to disseminate research and understand its impact. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a variety of different approaches that can be taken. I firmly believe that we need to take mixed methods approaches to doing that. And what I mean by that is, uh, where possible, use quantitative approaches. So how many people watched a webinar? How many people participated in a an event? But those are some of the very basic and, and nowadays easier to calculate or, or quantify uh, metrics of, of success. And those are just success for participation, right? They're not actual impact in terms of change, in terms of attitudes, knowledge, or behaviors. And so what you'll often hear is this idea of knowledge, attitudes, and practice, or CAP surveys. So through surveys, interviews, focus groups, even pre and post event um, uh, questionnaires, we can use somewhat quantitative, somewhat qualitative approaches to understand the impact impact of what we've done. And one of the big pink points I'd like to stress here for everybody is it's not enough to just do a short-term impact. We really need to be thinking about sort of medium and long-term outcomes. Very few research projects and, and very few activities uh, really are evaluated on a longer-term basis. And we see, this is where programs come into place, where we see longer multi-year sort of cohort approaches to understanding impact. That's where we're going to really truly understand our approach, uh, our impact rather. Hey, and re related to this was somebody's asked that uh, ROI, return on investment, can be a hard denominator when you're dealing with political timelines. How do we champion science that may take years to get on the farm? How do we push government and industry to understand this? Well, I think ultimately we need, that means we need to have better engagement. Policymakers and folks that are making decisions are doing so at a, at a much quicker pace than research can be done. And so what we need to help ensure is that first and foremost, those policy questions, those challenges that policymakers are being faced with are communicated down uh, downstream to researchers and those that are working actively on farms. And we need that sort of feedback loop as well. We need researchers to have meaningful conversations with those that are making decisions about what we do know today and what we think we know in terms of uh, some decisions that need to be made. Uh, timelines are always going to be a challenge. We're never going to be able to have a novel question answered rapidly or very, very rarely are we going to have that. But we do have many different methods that can be used, such as rapid, rapid evidence assessments. COVID-19 is a great example of that. We had a novel challenge and yet researchers were able to rise to the, the challenge, especially when funding is involved and manpower. And, and we can... Uh, rapidly synthesize what we do know and we can use approaches like Delphi methods or expert panels to try and understand what might be the major mechanisms or the best approach to move forward. It's not perfect but it's certainly better than uh, choosing something uh, a little bit blindly. So we this the short answer is we need more engagement, we need more communication between these different players at the same table. Yeah, people and communication. Some technologies can be, can be quite costly to implement. In your experience, how big of an issue is that in adoption? I think economics is always going to play an important role in change of any kind. Now, there's some layers to that. Is it a one-time investment or is it a continued investment that's that needs to be incurred, for example? And what's the nature of that cost? Is it a cost in terms of real dollars or is it a cost, in, uh, an opportunity cost? Is it someone's time that's being put in? And again, I liken this to, to uh, biosecurity, where I'm not just asking producers to make a few small changes and then they can go about their merry way. 
Biosecurity is a series of habits. It needs to be done day in and day out. And breaking the chain of habits is actually going to, well, in one case, it could ultimately be the difference between prevention versus infection. And so we need to understand the nature of those costs and we need to articulate why someone should make that investment. Again, whether it's dollars or time, which of course can be quantified in dollars as well. So we need to do a better job of articulating what are we asking them to do, uh, them being whatever our end user we're talking about, what's the real investment, and then we need to make uh, measure, take measured approaches to demonstrate the benefits, right? There should be benefits uh, that accrue either short term, immediately or long term associated with some type of investment. Otherwise, it simply doesn't make sense. There's always going to be an argument in the production of food that it's the right thing to do or it's what consumers expect, but we need to balance that with what's the end benefit at the end of the day. So whether you use partial budgeting, whether you simply um, start to actually um, try to infer some benefits, but we need to make more um, serious attempts to say, here's the upfront cost is associated with this. Here's the potential benefit. That benefit could be an accrual in real revenue, or it could be mitigation of further losses. That's something that we talk a lot about in the nature of, in the context of biosecurity as well. Yeah, actually it bring, makes me think of a, uh, an information meeting we put on with that in mind a number of years ago regarding traceability. And I'll mm. never forget somebody standing up at the end of the meeting saying, I came to this meeting to tell you guys to forget about all this stuff. It was a waste of my time. I don't have time for this. And he says, I'm going home realizing that if it costs me a cent a hog or if it costs me 10 cents a hog, I need to do this. So it, it's getting that message with the, the, the true benefit to them and to consumers. Absolutely. So, that um, here's, a, here's a loaded question for you. How do we deal with fake news or the anti-farming agenda that does not believe in science? Yeah, it's, um, I, I joke that, you know, I mean, the last year or two, or perhaps four, if you're in the United States, uh, is is a very good example of the power of both social media and some of the mediums that have really risen to power for the general public, and uh, perhaps our in collective inability to discern what is actually based in evidence or based in fact, and what is either a, a specific, as you say, anti-farming agenda, so a deliberate and disingenuous uh, sort of attempt to, to dissuade people from participating in a given sector to um, ill-informed, uh, I'll say, opinions. Uh, that's not malicious, but still uh, incorrect. Um, there are many different ways to do this. I think one of the most meaningful things is for our sector to be meaningfully engaged with the end users that are being subjected to this kind of information. We often in agriculture talk about the consumer and simply state, especially in livestock agriculture, that the consumer just is so removed from farming that they don't understand what we do and why. Well, I usually kind of smirk at that, that um, argument because I don't think we do a good job of explaining what we do and why. And you can actually see that some provinces in Canada have and, and other jurisdictions outside of Canada have actively taken and put in regulations and policies that actually further remove the consumer from, from agriculture. And I don't know if that's necessarily the right approach. It certainly protects farms from uh, serious situations where people, say activists, are trying to get onto farms. I, I am firm believer that we need to protect farms from that type of situation. But we are not doing ourselves much service when it comes to actually communicating about what we do and why for the consumers. And on that token, we also do not do a great job of listening. And so I think the real ability for us to tackle and address fake news is going to come from having more meaningful engagement with the people that are asking questions and are seeking out information and sometimes getting the wrong information. And we also need to do a better job of plainly, clearly, and consistently communicating what we do, why we do it, and using credible and sustainable methods and organizations to share that information. Let's give the people that are subjected to fake news a real evidence-based credible outlet from organizations, from government to not-for-profit to industries that can actually demonstrate, here's what we do, here's why, if you wanna know more information, here's who or here's how to follow up. I think those are some of the real um, meaningful approaches to addressing this uh, ongoing and I think pervasive challenge. And do you think we have an issue that there's a aware that that some of our intermediaries that we use 
may not be aware of some of the information and maybe perpetrating some of it further. Any thoughts on that? It's a challenge. I mean, I would, for the individual that asked the question, I would love to know sort of the definition or what they're thinking about in terms of intermediaries. Um, of course, it, you know, everything is can can be boiled down to that game of broken telephone sometimes, right? So as we get from researchers, primary researchers that have developed um, a, a technology and innovation or have information to share to turning that into plain language, there is an art there. And there is importantly, a, 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 or a, there's a piece that's very important in terms of not losing the essence of what the actual research tells us. So simply not boiling it down into a conclusion. And we know a certain, um, a certain former president that was very good at taking some evidence-based information and boiling it down to something that actually was far from and in some ways actually antagonistic to, to what the real evidence suggests. And so we need to, well, a couple of things. We need to make sure that our intermediaries, whether they are on-farm advisors, other organizations within our supply chain that are removed from primary research, but are much more responsible and closely linked to our end users of research, we need to ensure that they have the right information. They have the level of detail that ensures they can communicate it consistently. And one of the ways for us to do that is to actually ensure that researchers closely work with the people responsible for developing these types of resources. If I'm uh, uh, not-for-profit that's listening right now and I'm I am one of those intermediaries I want to make sure I'm working with subject matter experts or those researchers at minimum to ensure I've got the messages right so we need to work together up and down the supply chain to ensure we're clearly and consistently communicating the right evidence at the end of the day who are who are some intermediaries that um what you know who who would they be and uh what might that look like well it's i mean ultimately it can be from uh, from an individual to an organization and so an individual could be uh well any on farm advisor from agronomist veterinarian nutritionist and so on that might attend a meeting for example to listen to some some research listen to a presentation watch a webinar or read a, a primary article for example but we've also got many active organizations elric is an example poultry industry council um dairy at guelph is is sort of a quasi intermediate and that they are made up of researchers but have some organizational capacity. Uh, and I, I suppose my organization, Acer Consulting, can be considered an intermediary as well. It's ultimately any group that is sometimes but not always responsible for generating new knowledge and more and they, so they have a function of dealing with new knowledge and they have a function with disseminating that knowledge. I, that would be my definition. Okay. And, um, and I think that you, you've gone around this but the question is, how do you see the role of thought leaders and early adopters among the pr producer community? Can they be helpful? Absolutely. I think we need to leverage these individuals more than ever. Um, one of the things I talked about in my in my talk, and I'll bring up again here, is the power of stories. There's a couple of uh, pieces that we, well, I am trying to champion all the time, and I use that word champion um, very deliberately. We have at the farming level, we have some serious innovation going on. We have some producers, I, I argue most producers, you give them a problem, they'll find a million different ways to solve it. They're usually quite practical and quite effective. So we need to find, uh, seek out these producers that are uh, succeeding and not just succeeding, but they are exceeding expectations on a given issue or in a particular practice. And we need to showcase those stories, not just what they did and what outcomes it achieved, I want to know what was in between their ears that got them to make that change in the first place. What incentivized them? What was it an incentive the way we are so sort of traditionally programmed to think about in terms of dollars and cents? You'd be amazed that when you talk about some of these other characteristics um, that, that ultimately go into value-added products or even things that are core components of what we expect in food today, animal care, environmental sustainability, we have producers that have every kind of mindset you can imagine from not interested, I don't care unless I get paid for it, I am not going to do any more, so you'll have to regulate me or mandate me, to producers that say this is the future of farming and we need to be on the forefront of making sure that 
we're doing everything we can and everyone in between. I want to bottle up the message and the mindset of those individuals in the latter example I just shared. And I want to turn that into a story, a case study, a way to, to demonstrate here is someone who is uh, embracing and embodying exactly what we want or what can lead to success. So case studies, stories, peer influence is all some of the pieces that I think we really need to leverage, not just among farmers, but across our supply chain. Yeah. And this kind of, flows right along into that. Can you discuss some strategies for knowledge transfer in multi-generational situations that you found successful? Yeah, I mean, especially when we're talking about at the farm level, right, we've got, uh, if, if succession planning is um, is a reality, um, and, and certainly hopefully uh, it is in more cases than not from, from a sustainability perspective, um, one of the big things we need to do is, is help facilitate knowledge being passed down. And one of the best ways I've seen to do that is to use uh, peer networks and individual or small group meetings. So getting those generations together at the same table, talking about why we do what we do and whether or not tweaks or improvements could be made. If there are questions, answering some of those questions and trying to make sure we build a foundation of knowledge and attitude for our next generation to take up, uh, uh, take up the reins and, and engage ideally more effectively in the farm. Uh, those are some of the best strategies. I think ultimately one of the things that we want to continue to leverage is really just what I was talking about in terms of peer learning. We want to take advantage of not just generations within a given family or on a given farm but let's let's take lessons learned from the old guard and let's share it with the new one and let's ideally take lessons learned about what worked let's take our understanding of what's working or what evidence tells us we should be doing and weave those together to inform the next generation on how they can improve succeed and be more sustainable Hey, I've got one last question, but really uh, all your other questions have pretty much answered it. They want to know who might be in the best position to champion coordination of advisory services. Yeah, I mean, that is a... Um the question, I think, uh, especially in the context of, uh, I'll call it our modern day extension KTT grip um, situation. And what I mean by that is that we have really a plethora of options in terms of individuals that have access to information. It's never been easier to access information today now than ever. The challenge, like we talked about, some misinformation, fake news, who, when, and how people get information, there is so much complexity here. What we need to do is leverage the public, the private, the not-for-profit, and the primary industry um, strengths and minimize the weaknesses. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to uh, try and use the not-for-profit sector. And so groups like ELRIC, groups like the Poultry Industry Council, groups like the Ontario uh, Soil Network, for example, uh, represent organizations that have the staff and the capacity to have meaningful and engaged and ideally full-time conversations with policymakers, with researchers, and with people that make decisions in the agricultural context. But they also have more accountability and more uh, flexibility, let's call it, to work, uh, to make decisions organizationally and to work to benefit these sectors themselves. Government can fund, but they're a little bit, well, they're certainly slow and they are, uh, they can be stagnant. Private industry have many different interests and it can be a challenge in trying, in trying to make them all cohesive and consistent across a broad range. Uh, I think at the end of the day, not-for-profit sector is best positioned to put this all together. And a, an Elric, for example, not to toot Elric's own horn on, on Horizon series too much, but Elric is, is uh, again, nicely positioned because they represent livestock across the board. And so, and, and again, not topic specific. I think those are some of the keys that we need in a mission and vision of an organization that can ultimately support a network because that's what KTT or in dissemination at the end of the day is going to be. No one organization owns this. No one organization owns these challenges. We ultimately need to find better pathways to promote and disseminate information to have success across the board. And again, just to reiterate and bring this all home, this can't just be a one-way approach. Whoever's responsible for stewarding this isn't just responsible for pushing research out. They are equally responsible for listening, for bringing those questions and those challenges challenges back in and informing the 
other way, the supply chain to respond, right? That's all about the give and take here. And I think that's going to be the key to sustainability and responding to evolu the evolution of our agricultural system. Thanks, Steve. Really appreciate the time you've given us today. You did an awesome presentation and uh, great to have discussion with you. Our next Horizon Series webinar will be on July the 26th, and it's going to be on water use in livestock. You can register for that on our website now, and uh, we'll be sending out notices. The white paper for today is posted on the uh, webinar I, or on our website. I uh, suggest everybody take a look at it and we'll get the water use one up around the same time as the uh, webinar for that. So again, thanks to our IT support in Charlotte Wall and uh, Steve, thanks for joining us and uh, see everyone next time.